Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, so today's uh, talk is on common uh, dermatological conditions that present in general practice. Um, I work at Delta Dermatology in Kingsford and um, I just wanted to point out a few uh, resources um, that I participate in. Um, so you can, um, if you are a social media fan, um, <laughs> you can um, uh, get some tips and um, uh, tricks uh, regarding common dermatological conditions as well as vulval skin conditions uh, by following our Instagram. Um, and we also have a Facebook page. These are the details of my practice. Um, you can take a photo or um, uh, you can contact us uh, via uh, our website. So today's talk is on um, common skin conditions and I've tried to divide it up. So there's a bit of a method to the madness. Um, it's, you know, there's over 3000 uh, skin conditions in dermatology and it's impossible to cover even um, a tiny bit of that in a talk this, um, of this nature. But um, I'll focus on my subspecialties, uh, predominantly vulval and pediatric dermatoses, uh, as well as a couple of disorders uh, to highlight hair and nail conditions as well. So vulval conditions first off. Um, to begin with, uh, when uh, women uh, present with a red vulva, uh, an uncomfortable vulva, um, often uh, the number one um, diagnosis is thrush, and we all think of acute thrush uh, as the commonest um, pa pathogenesis, uh, but this condition called chronic vulval vaginal candidiasis or chronic thrush uh, is uh, now uh, quite well um, understood and now gaining a little bit of um, popularity as a diagnosis uh, amongst general practice as well. This is a term to describe recurrent infections that occur multiple times in an um, individual within the same year, um, and it's up to four times or more um, without actual clearance of the yeast um, in the individual. Um, and often in these uh, patients, there's a genetic predisposition to carry the yeast at low numbers usually um, uh, indefinitely. Um, and there might be uh, the genetic um, risk uh, might be in and the uh, in the mutation in the um, estrogen receptor, which um, then predisposes the individual to hold on to the yeast um, throughout their lifetime whilst they are um, sexually active. So any time from puberty up to menopause. And this is a condition that women can suffer quite silently from and the symptoms can vary. Some women may not seek um, any help at all despite having um, this condition. Um, and just treat it as acute thrush uh, with ad hoc treatments over the counter. Um, and this can be often, uh, unfortunately, the way uh, medical professionals treat uh, these patients as well. Um, however, there is really good uh, studies to show that improvement uh, and good quality of life improvement can be achieved if we uh, treat this very differently to acute thrush in that um, we consider these patients as having a chronic condition, which is hormonally uh, exacerbated, uh, which tends to flare usually um, mid cycle of their men menstrual cycle um, with that uh, hormonal surge. Um, and uh, the symptoms are slightly different to acute thrush. So paying attention to the actual symptoms being described as more um, not necessarily just each um, and not the usual cottage cheese discharge. Some women may not even describe a change in the discharge, but if you prod a little bit further, you may appreciate that they describe that they feel that their discharge is heavier than um, what they feel an average woman might have. Um, and uh, they normally describe a discomfort, burning, stinging. It's not just um, an itch. And typically it can involve the skin on the outside as well as the vaginal um, mucosa. So the vulva as well as the mucosa. And uh, it can also involve the perianal um, skin as well. Um, the classic uh, feature is that cycling of the symptoms with it being particularly worse uh, mid-cycle and pre-menses um, and then improving during the menstrual cycle. Obviously, uh, you can have concurrent conditions and I, it's not uncommon for me to see 
condition like chronic thrush uh, compounded with chronic dermatitis. And in that case, you might not get this discernible change in the symptoms uh, from premenstrally to during menses, but they might describe it's more stinging, irritated premenstrually, and then itchy during menses due to pads or liner wearing due to the dermatitis. But it's important to tease those out so that you can appreciate there's two separate conditions going on. But essentially, thrush presents with that premenstrual flare, chronic thrush, and tends to get better um, during um, the time when um, they're having their periods and uh, straight afterwards as well. So it's all in the in the clinical history. Um, 90% of the diagnosis is made through that. And then uh, another feature um, is uh, women that keep describing urinary tract uh, symptoms. So they, they'll keep describing um, some intermittent dysuria, irritation, um, and sometimes even frequency. But every time you culture, it's negative um, because you're culturing for bacterial um, colonization, uh, bacterial, um, you know, uh, 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 in the MSU, but it's actually yeast colonizing the urethra that's causing the irritation. So, um, and often with the antibiotics, things can even get worse um, for these women. So um, it's a really good uh, indicator if you have all these symptoms line up. And so um, often the case that they, once you ask all these little hints, you can actually tease out, yep, they're having all these symptoms. And they feel like for once, someone's actually listing everything they've had and got the diagnosis and they feel so relieved that um, you're able to pinpoint everything they've suffered for 10 to 15 years and finally arrive at a diagnosis that gives them some sort of uh, hope of treatment. And typically uh, it is due to candida albicans and most of these women get relief from oral fluconazole. Um, that's, you know, majority, nine, to, um, nine out of 10 patients. And you would treat this slightly differently. So low dose, longer term, so 50 milligrams up to 100 milligrams daily. Um, and typically I would have them on up to six weeks at a time uh, to see how they improve and don't expect them to get better within the first week. The longer they've suffered from this and the longer the yeast has made a nice little home there, the harder it's going to be to uh, get rid of it. And so full six weeks of treatment prior to assessing how they're feeling and then um, potentially based on 50% improvement, 80, 90% improvement, considering weaning regimen or even escalation of treatment. Typically, a maintenance regimen would consist of twice weekly um, fluconazole just to keep the yeast numbers at bay. It's not a strict um, infection per se in that it's not due to true high levels of yeast numbers. It's more of a the reaction that the woman has to low numbers of yeast. So maintaining it this way often gives significant improvement in their quality of life to the point that they can then um, have a good sexual function. Um, and, and one of the most important conditions that we treat at the clinic is this because it provides the most uh, improvement in their quality of life index questionnaire. Um, so this, this condition and addressing this makes the most um, you know, rewarding experience for me in my practice on a daily basis. Uh, I, I did mention that um, majority are candid albicans. The a few can be um, more resistant strains uh, like candida glabrata, cruzii, and, and so on. So these species are not usually responsive to fluconazole um, and they uh, may require other treatments like boric acid pessaries, which can be compounded. Another common vulval condition that I see, um, which may or may not be symptomatic depending on the individual and the extent and severity of their disease is vulval psoriasis. It often presents as a, a, a secondary diagnosis when a woman uh, presents. Um, so they might have thrush or they might have uh, another condition like dermatitis. And then you see this classic uh, psoriasiform eruption. Um, so often people, uh, find it hard to tell between dermatitis and psoriasis. So psoriasis has this very uh, salmon-colored uh, uh, pinkish uh, dis um, color, and it has this well-demarcated uh, distribution classically involving the interlabial sulcus, the area between the uh, labia um, majora and labia minora, 
this interlabial sulcus symmetrical involvement, that classic color. And then you can see here this um, uh, particular scale, which um, often patients uh, describe as discharge, but in fact, it is scaling um, from the way that psoriasis, the skin builds up with this increased skin uh, turnover. And it's like wet tissue paper um, on the skin there. And that can be something that women are often uh, uncomfortable about mentioning or are um, particularly concerned about. Um, it can be itchy, but uh, sometimes it might not be even symptomatic, uh, but improving that appearance and treating that can make a difference in women that are very symptomatic from their psoriasis. Uh, psoriasis um, obviously has a genetic predisposition. A third of women will uh, report having a family history um, of psoriasis and it has classical distribution elsewhere on the body. So it's good to look for clues on the elbows, knees, scalp, ears, uh, navel and natal cleft. So involving the um, top of the buttocks, um, butt cheeks um, so that you can uh, appreciate this as psoriasis. If you're unsure whether it's psoriasis, dermatitis, something else, um, it's worthwhile looking in those classic places where psoriasis loves to go. Which um, uh, And then, uh, as I said, symptoms are very variable. Uh, there is a whole range of treatments for psoriasis. Psoriasis is uh, one of the most uh, amazingly well-researched and uh, well-treated conditions these days in dermatology. We've got a whole suite of uh, new treatments that are coming out every year. Um, in the form of biologic treatments, which cost the government $20,000 a year per patient to provide indefinitely uh, for the rest of their life if they choose to uh, stay on it. Um, so these are really expensive treatments that are being subsidized for generalized body psoriasis or facial or hand foot psoriasis, but unfortunately not for any of my vulval patients, which as you can imagine, if hand and foot dermatitis is functionally disabling, so can um, psoriasis of the vulva. So um, I'm able to contact some uh, and access these medications through compassionate access, uh, either through the hospital uh, at RPA or Westmead, where I also have been working and um, or in my private practice through the drug companies directly. So for some young women that are completely debilitated by symptoms and dysfunctional uh, in terms of sexual function, we can um, access these really expensive medications, which are life-changing for these patients, just as they are for patients with general body psoriasis or facial or hand, um, hand uh, feet psoriasis. Uh, but before that, there are obviously lots of creams that um, you can um, trial for your patients, starting with topical um, steroids. Um, so topical steroids are useful when the psoriasis is active. And as with any chronic skin condition, you have to have a plan for maintenance. Uh, good topical steroids um, to begin with on the vulval skin would be something like Advantan. I prefer the fatty ointment. I prefer everything in the ointment base, um, particularly for the vulva, because it's fantastic um, application, um, stays on the skin, better absorbed, um, and also provides a bit of a uh, barrier and a moisture uh, for a condition like psoriasis, which likes to go to areas of friction curb so which is a condition called, uh, which is a, a word uh, describing areas of uh, condition that goes to areas of friction. So psoriasis is, um, uh, so uh, ointment-based treatment such as fatty ointment, advantage fatty ointment is perfect as an initial point of uh, starting treatment for these patients. Then I would, um, I would do this daily. Um, then as a skin improves, say a week or two into treatment, so daily at night, advanced and fatty ointment, a week or two into treatment, I will then um, change them over um, once the acute flare is settled to a tar-based treatment, so 2% LPC or some such um, preparation that they can tolerate. You wouldn't want to use the tar when they're very, um, very irritated. It actually would sting them and they would uh, not use it at all. So it's only for um, when they come off the acute flare and then um, are just more for maintenance to prevent um, recurrent flares. So you're minimizing the number of flares and the frequency of flares by using a maintenance treatment like TAR. Um, and then we escalate uh, beyond that to uh, other uh, systemic treatments. So I've used methotrexate, cyclosporin, um, and uh, in appropriate uh, cases, acetretin as well. Um, and then we now have amazing biologics, which we can get special access for these women. Um, so another red vulval condition is uh, lichen planus. This is an autoimmune condition, 
which is extremely, extremely painful. Um, it presents like ulcers, uh, but it's actually erosion. So the top layer of the skin, the epidermis has been removed. And characteristically, you can see here on both sides of the labia minora, it has, there's this glazed erythematous um, erosion there with this peripheral hyperkeratosis, this white area of um, abutting the glazed erosion. And that's very classic for lichen planus. Lichen planus can be a very um, discharge and a raw, painful condition, extremely painful. And most GPs would do a swab, make sure that's not hepatic, and herpes can look like anything. It can look like ulcers, erosions, giant ulcers, not, the, not always the typical punched out ulcers, so always exclude those infections. But, um, you know, the, this is a very classic um, a lichen planus um, of the vulva, um, erosive lichen planus of the vulva. It, often starts in the 40s to 50s age group, um, and it has a, a risk of scarring of the vulva, particularly the labia, and a, a very small risk, um, less than 5.5% uh, uh, reported in worldwide literature uh, of, of vulval cancer. It can have classic it can have um, involvement on the rest of the body with classic um, hyperpigmented uh, papules and plaques on the rest of the body, um, particularly the back, um, lower back, armpits, wrists, um, and legs. Uh, there can also be hair and nail involvement, classic for lichen planus, and oral involvement. So it's important to look inside the mouth to see if they have any ulcers inside the mouth as well. Um, and treatment depends on how severe they are. Often this is a condition that gynees um, would send to us because this, you know, I would say at least uh, two thirds of the patients end up needing systemic therapy, methotrexate, um, azathioprine, um, and sometimes biologic treatments as a um, off-label uh, treatment. Um, so Gail uh, Fisher, Professor Fisher, um, has uh, done a number of articles uh, uh, where she's uh, reported the use of biologics um, such as interleukin-17 um, for this condition. And there's some promising data so we can have access to these medications as well for these patients that don't respond to the classical immune suppression um, medications. All of these, uh, this would be biopsy, obviously. So, so far, chronic thrush and psoriasis is a very clinical diagnosis. Nobody needs to do a biopsy for that, but this is something you would want to biopsy um, as because you're going to potentially um, put them on um, immune suppression. Topicals work for about a third of patients to control their disease. You would use really potent topical steroids such as clobetazole, not clobetazone, which is a Umivate, which you just get over the counter, one of the weakest steroids you can get, but clobetazole, which is the strongest steroid, uh, topical steroid you can get in Australia, which is compounded and um, really needs a special access TGA scheme uh, to prescribe. But it's um, very effective for a very severe disease like this uh, in a third of patients. And also they would need, um, because it involves the vaginal um, passage, mucosal passage as well, they would need uh, a pessary. Um, I usually do predsol pessary, which are normally used as suppositories, but I would just modify it and provide it as a vaginal pessary for my patients so that they can get uh, internal uh, vaginal mucosal treatment as well as the topical external vulval treatment. And final condition we have is lichen sclerosis. These are my top four um, vulva conditions that I like to talk about. Lichen sclerosis, another autoimmune disorder, um, which is often associated with other autoimmune conditions, the commonest of which is autoimmune thyroid disease. Uh, it's also very classically uh, presents with this white uh, atrophied patches um, with uh, often, unfortunately, starring already in place. Um, and it will be really helpful if these uh, conditions can be picked up early to minimize the risk of scarring, which is very, very um, emotionally, psychologically distressing to the woman and um, also can impact their sexual and uh, health needs, including uh, ability to have pap smears. I've had patients, um, you know, every couple of years come with um, closure of their uh, secondary um, urinary retention due to inability to pass a urine due to complete closure of the endroitus and, um, and the labia. And that is something so preventable from a very simple treatment. Often this uh, is, you know, 99.99% .99 of patients are managed just with topical steroids. I've got over a thousand patients with lichen sclerosis and 
of those, you know, um, the risk of vulval cancer um, in worldwide literature is reported to be about 5%. One in 20 patients with lichen sclerosis um, is reported to develop vulval cancer. However, in the group that Gail and um, Jennifer Bradford um, published a study on, they showed that it was less than um, 1%, significantly less than 1% um, uh, due to good treatment, ongoing treatment. And that's the way um, I also manage my patients. Um, that's the way I was taught by Professor Fisher. And it uh, means that, you know, of the many, many, many patients that I have with this condition, um, uh, the two that we have picked up to have vulval, invasive vulval cancer, you know, were the ones that were lost to follow up and um, came back uh, years after uh, or um, from someone else's care without having regular topical management. Um, in cases where they can still develop cancer, often they're picked up very early. So they're in, in situ um, vulval cancer um, and uh, they can be managed very well surgically um, in most cases. Um, and we used to say that this, um, so I've got a range uh, between two years, um, children as young as two years of age, all the way to women in their 90s with, first, uh, with the first diagnosis of lichen sclerosis. And we used to say this condition um, has two modal, um, bimodal um, onset of a prepubertal and postmenopausal. We know that previous studies, they used to state that um, children with pre, uh, pubertal onset would then um, have good prognosis and often their disease will burn out. That is not the case, and that is not believed to be necessarily the, um, the case. And therefore, these patients need lifelong, and these young women need, young girls and women, as they go through puberty, need ongoing monitoring, lifelong monitoring. Most of my patients will be on yearly visits if um, they are diagnosed and they know what to watch out for, when to come in early, um, when they <laughs> need biopsy. Um, and, uh, you know, even in the young children, a lot of them are able to learn very early uh, what are the features and what to look out for. And unfortunately, you can see here, this woman has significant scarring with complete resorption of the labia minora, some clitoral hood uh, phimosis, and, uh, and that's um, totally preventable. So we might start with um, a quick quiz because I've been talking for a while. Um, so this is the first uh, question, which of these depicts a vulval cancer? Um, so I've got a, a, a picture A on the pigmented skin, picture B, picture C and D here. Um, and I'll start the quiz. So can you all sign up to the quiz um, and start answering? Are you able to access the quiz? Excellent. Okay. Give it a few more seconds for everyone to make up their mind. Wonderful. Okay. So, just um, go back to my previous slide. So um, most of you picked uh, part B. In fact, um, none of you picked uh, uh, Picture C, and it's actually that that's the vulval cancer. The vulval cancer is here at the um, at this area. And the reason I put that, because I was being a bit tricky, is um, is it stumped me as well. And I just wanted to show you how unpredictable um, and unpredictable looking some things in dermatology can be. This patient, in fact, went to um, you know my mentor, went to Jenny, went to um, then came to me. I was about to send her out saying, look, everything looks fine. I can't um, see anything. And then um, she just insisted, look, I've come from three hours away. Is there anything that you could do? Should we just do a biopsy? And I did a blind biopsy. 
um, essentially, and it came back as uh, intraepithelial neoplasia of the vulva. So it just goes to show high grade. It just goes to show that it's not so um, obvious and you just have to have a high degree of suspicion. She had had, she had, had several diagnoses, uh, diagnoses thrown at her. Um, she's previously, um, she had a dyspareunia at that site focally. And obviously when there's pain, um, you look for skin pathology, but there was nothing specific that stood out to me. Um, but it is worthwhile considering a biopsy when, when someone continues to complain of tenderness or discomfort and uh, you can't see overt pathology, just as this case shows. The other, um, this is like uh, picture A is um, lichen sclerosis affecting a young um, prepubertal, uh, uh, young girl, uh, prepubertal girl um, uh, in uh, skin of color. Um, B showing significant scarring um, from um, poorly treated lichen sclerosis with lots of architectural atypia. And uh, D is um, a lady who has had um, genital, um, a HPV uh, wart change, which um, we um, like to treat with Cantarida. Excellent. So we'll move on to the next section, pediatric dermatology. I'm sorry we can't cover uh, all of these at uh, much um, de in much detail, but um, uh, so a common thing that I get. Um, in this uh, age group is acne. Um, so acne, although it is a condition that I see commonly in teenagers, it can affect any age group. So I do see adult women with acne, um, men with acne, um, as well as uh, teenagers, but predominantly it's a condition um, in the young younger population. Um, there is uh, often with a very severe acne, there is a genetic predisposition. Um, there's a few different types of acne, and that's something that often I find if you can distinguish the different types, then it aids you to choose the different treatments. So uh, typically the four subtypes are comedonal, which are whiteheads and blackheads. And these respond really well to uh, uh, treatments such as um, uh, keratolytics like salicylic acid in washes and chemical peels, um, as well as physical um, measures such as um, such as uh, skin needling and skin pens. Um, they uh, are much more difficult. Uh, they also respond very well to topical retinoids. Um, and they're the ones where you would, uh, if you see these comedonal acne, um, if you can see my arrow here, this is uh, this type of acne, these um, flesh colored to white papules on this gentleman, this uh, young man's um, skin here and that, um, these respond really well to topical retinoids. So you can offer um, epiduo and ad um, adapalene alone um, for treatment of this, Steva A, um, Trechnoin um, for treatment of this. And uh, often a, a common mistake when um, starting patients on retinoids is not um, giving clear instructions on how to start it. People, often when they come to me, they complained that they used it for a week or two weeks and threw it away um, because they weren't told to slowly and gradually build up. It's slow, um, very slow um, and low um, at levels that you slowly build up. So start with once a week overnight. Um, then second week, um, you would do it twice weekly. Third week, uh, three nights a week and uh, five, next week, five nights and seven nights. So slow build up with really good sun protection. Um, and you'll find that the patients won't um, be throwing their um, medication away and actually see significant, um, stick to the course and see improvement. Um, important that you advise about dryness, sun sensitivity and moisturizing with this. Um, and it's not spot treatment, it's all over. And that's very effective for comedonal acne. Inflammatory acne is the papular pustula acne, the zits that sit on the surface. These are seen in this uh, young man. I'll just point out which ones these are. If I can get my arrow on the right screen. There we go. These ones here. Uh, this one here, for example, is inflammatory acne. He doesn't have too many of those. And those are um, zits that sit on the surface. Uh, they respond very well to doxycycline minocycline, clindamycin as a topical, um, the antibiotic type um, treatments. 
Then there's hormonal acne. Um, hormonal acne, traditionally, it's not, in majority of cases, there is no derangement of hormones. Um, often I wouldn't even do a hormonal panel uh, unless there are other features that concern me um, that are beyond just acne um, to suggest in a hormonal imbalance. Um, and if, um, and this is usually a particular pattern and a flare that's reported in young ladies, um, women in their 20s, 30s, teenagers of uh, flare, premenstrual, et cetera. And these, uh, these tend to be uh, um, particularly um, focused around the jawline and cheeks and um, come and go with their period uh, premenstrually. And these tend to respond really well to the pill, to spironolactone, superterrin acetate. So all of these are effective treatment for this type of acne. Um, and then finally, nodular cystic acne, which is when often they come to me after you have um, treated most of the other types or um, when, when you notice this as a predominant feature of the acne. This acne, I would set, caution you not to play around too much with any treatment and just send them straight for, um, for a dermatologist because um, this is the acne that scars. This is a problem with this gentleman. The predominant type is nodular cystic acne, this young man, and he has already quite a significant scarring. He develops little cysts under the skin. And then before you know it, three to four months into having acne, he's significantly scarred. And these patients, the scarring, unfortunately, is quite, quite as a, by nature, is irreversible. And we could have done a lot if we had seen him uh, sooner and prevented the scarring. So, uh, so these patients uh, starting recognizing their type of acne and starting um, the referral process and uh, treatment early is the key thing so that they're not left with lifelong scarring, even with the best scar treatments, which are multimodal, um, involving laser, peels, subsessions, fillers, et cetera, we can only realistically achieve up to 60% improvement. So they are left with quite a degree of scarring despite all the best efforts. So the sooner that you can begin the referral process and get them seen, the better it is for that young person. And also, you know, it's also uh, um, often I get patients for isotretinol and um, in the adult acne stage where, you know, um, a young man or young woman is continuing to suffer acne well beyond their teenage years, which are, I guess might, some people might consider right of passage and it'll wear off. Well, when they're having it as an adult, they don't want to continue to be on doxycycline or epidural and forever have acne. And they, they want to get rid of the acne for good. And these are patients worth referring as well because giving them a successful course of isotretinoin can guarantee about 80% of those individuals that do a proper course for the right duration at the right dose can get a cure for their acne, which means that they will never get acne ever again. And even though it's a year long course or more, um, these individuals appreciate the fact that you've cleared the acne forever and they don't have to be sentenced to being on the contraceptive pool for 10 years for the acne or doxycycline on and off for the next 10 years or um, have their pregnancy um, choices or their fertility choices affected by coming on and off um, acne medications, whereas they could have done isotretinol and two months later, finish the course and try and fall pregnant without any issues. So these are that's another group that's worth referring as well, adult acne. Um, so triggers, um, acne is multi um, uh, pathogenesis process with hormonal, follicular occlusion, bacterial colonization and inflammation playing a key role. And as I said, early treatment um, is the key for our acne management. Another common um, Skin condition I see, um, or another two, are Malaska and warts. Um, these are both virally mediated, Malaska by uh, pox virus and warts by the HPV virus. And uh, as you know, there are um, many, many strains of warts, uh, HPV virus, and um, they can affect different parts of the body. Um, Malaska are kind of a rite of passage of a young person, um, young child, and um, you usually see this in um, uh, childcare age group. And it goes around the, in the family with all the other siblings catching it at the same time. Uh, kind of like chicken pox, you get it once and you tend to have lifelong immunity. And, um, you know, most patients are managed by you guys really well um, with good advice and reassurance, um, say, uh, explaining that these can be spread um, via the 
the viral particles can be spread by auto inoculation, which means they can be spread by scratching um, across uh, with the fingernail and then passed on to other parts of the skin, and also um, through rubbing with uh, loofers and um, shower um, products, as well as toweling, etc. It can also spread through warm baths, so encourage uh, young children not to share with their sibling in, in a bath, and also from one part of their body to another in a bath. So ideally. Uh, if they can have um, showers, that's better. They can still go to the pool as long as it's not a warm pool. Um, it tends to like warmer environments to get out and swim. So uh, cold pools and beach is fine. Um, and eventually your body will recognize the virus, mount an immune response and get rid of it in its own time. Average is about a year, can go beyond two years in some people and as fast as a few months, six months or so in others. Um, but it's not necessarily a reflection of their immune competency, it's just the way things are. Um, however, often patients get very anxious and the key times when I uh, see patients getting anxious is when uh, uh, one of two things happens, whether when um, a few lesions pop, become multiple um, to 20, 50, 100, and that's a good time to think about treatment. And also um, when patients notice small little bumps then become, then they notice one or two become really red, angry, et cetera. Um, so those are times when you might need extra reassurance or explanation or referral. Um, warts, very common, often on the hands and feet, can be spread sometimes also on the face, which are tend, to, uh, tend to be flat or plain warts. Um, and uh, we treat them in, by various modalities, uh, either patient applied or doctor applied or in clinic treatments. So move on to the next question. Sorry about that. Let me just move on. And I might get you to participate in this one. Let me just get the poll going. Yeah, which is your preferred management um, for um, this particular condition? Right, yeah. So warts, um, what is your preferred management option in a general practice setting? So majority of you prefer salicylic acid, cryotherapy, those are the bigger, um, so the more votes there is, the bigger the um, writing will be. So cryotherapy, salicylic acid. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. We might just move on. So no intervention is an option. Um, and my preferred treatment once they've seen you and come to me is um, cantharidin. Um, this is a blistering cream that we, uh, we apply in clinic um, with uh, to the specific area on the um, on where the wart or mollusca is. And it creates a little blister, um, which is painless. So it's perfect for pediatric patients, but I also use it for adults with um, warts elsewhere. Um, and it uh, is really, really effective. Usually one treatment with uh, uh, cantharidin or cantharidin plus, which has a little bit of uh, salicylic acid, uh, which causes a bit of frosting. Um, and one treatment is sufficient to treat very thin ones and uh, two treatments a week or two apart is sufficient to treat more thicker ones or more resistant ones. And a really good outcome, patients are very happy. Um, and with Molusco, you might only treat a handful of lesions, um, which then um, your immune system is then triggered into getting rid of the rest for you. And that's usually the way I explain to patients that um, Molusco and warts, for example, work. It's Essentially, um, you're, we want to trigger your immune system into recognizing there's a virus hiding um, underneath this lesion. And whatever we do is about creating a bit of an inflammation locally. Um, so all our treatments are based on creating inflammation. So a little bit of discomfort, irritation on the area. And then the immune system goes, hey, what's going on? Let's go and check out what's happening in that area. Goes along and the immune cells have a little bit of party, rub shoulders with the virus and go, well, that shouldn't be here. Let's get rid of this guy. And then once that immune um, response is triggered, then all of the lesions tend to go quite quickly. And that 
uh, is certainly the case with Moraska and Wart. Um, so whatever means you use, um, they are not particularly tip, uh, viral um, antivirals. They all um, work by the same uh, methodology. So you can choose TCA, salicylic acid, um, cryotherapy, uh, other methods like, for example, for mollusca, one uh, that really works in older children is pricking the core of the mollusca. So mollusca are typically these umbilicated lesions at the center is the uh, body of the mollusca and you can prick out these um, with a sterile needle, uh, the center of the lesion. We do this at the children's hospital um, with nitrous for children as young as five. And we might treat 10 of them in the one go, and then they might come back in a month for another 10. And then mom and dad, while they're sleeping, might uh, do the others if we give them some sterile needles. Um, but older children works really well. You don't need nitrous. It's not a painful. It's just that uh, a five-year-old won't sit still if you approach them with a needle. Uh, so that we give them nitrous and let them watch um, something on the iPad in the procedure room while um, with the nurse while we uh, quickly flick these out. Um, with the warts, something specifically I like to use in immune suppressed patients, so the young kitties that are immune suppressed due to various treatments um, or have immune disorders. Leomycin works really well in adults as well. Um, so I normally bring them along to the hospital, um, get approval through the hospital committee and a few injections um, uh, after, under local, after local anaesthetic and it I can treat um, you know, distal warts, um, not just the area where we injected, works really, really well in those patients with HIV, in patients with other immune suppression diseases where they have hundreds of warts. Um, you treat a small area, about a centimetre um, in size with bleo, and, um, you know, it can have distal effects treating the, um, you know, other areas of warts on the uh, distal, other parts of the body can also start disappearing with one or two treatments. So it works really, really well. Um, specifically with mollusca, often you see these giant lesions and these giant lesions are not infection of the mollusca. It's actually uh, in mollusca that's about to resolve. That's the immune response. So these patients sometimes can be given antibiotics, but I urge you not to give antibiotics because that's actually the immune response and it's not a true infection. It's the mollusca on its way out. So reassurance is all you need. Um, and then um, other things that they can, mollusca can often develop a bit of a dermatitis around it, particularly in children that um, are predisposed to dermatitis. So a bit of topical steroid uh, to treat the, um, treat the dermatitis and um, that should help um, keep the child comfortable. I don't recommend curatage or surgical excision and I'm, I'm not that keen on cryotherapy in young children or warts or, um, I mean, on the body. Um, you can treat it on the ankle sites like the hands and feet, uh, but it tends to scar if you do cryotherapy on the body um, and definitely not um, surgical measures like curatage or excision. So this is just a picture of what the um, one of the uh, post-cantharidin uh, treatments can look like. So wart, we asked, that uh, we just pair back and then apply the cantharidin a week later. Um, they come back, there was a blister that developed within the first 24 hours. We, we give them a sterile needle to go home with, they prick it, and it's uh, resolved to leave this, um, this area where the wart has completely gone, um, and that's what we're after. So uh, another condition that I, I see very, quite commonly as well in children and young children uh, from neonate to infancy is hemangioma of infancy. It's a condition that develops, it's a birthmark that develops um, a few days, two weeks after birth. Um, and uh, it uh, is a very common birthmark uh, in up to one in 20 to one in 10 um, patients, um, children. And uh, it has a typical phase of growth uh, in the first three to nine months where it rapidly grows uh, to a certain size from a little pinpoint um, air, uh, red bump, um, and then um, it tends to regress or um, spontaneously fade away. Um, the regression can be um, statistically quoted up to 50% of children by age five will have resolution, 90% um, of children by age nine uh, will have resolution. So that's the rough numbers in terms of reassuring the pa parent. It, if there's one or, uh, or handful, um, less than um, 
five, then um, you don't need to do any internal um, assessments like liver ultrasound. However, the more they have, the greater the risk of internal involvement uh, with hemangiomas internally, particularly the liver. And certain patterns uh, may also predispose you to wonder if there's um, syndromic involvement as well. Uh, so this particular child um, on the left here has um, a hemangioma um, that is uh, the red strawberry birthmark, but they can also have a deeper component in about a third or 30% of cases where there is a bluish uh, or, uh, uh, or um, deeper lump that's not just a skin surface uh, change. And this is um, it's often um, something that can um, be missed in the initial assessment. So it's something that's worthwhile in straightforward cases for you to keep monitoring. So ask them to come back if you noticed it, you know, in their first month check, et cetera, you would ask six, six weeks check, you'd ask them to come back at three and six months and check on that specifically, see if there's a deeper component developing because they, this might then change uh, your management in terms of whether you refer and whether they should start treat, treatment. So let's go to another quiz if um, you're still awake. Um, so this one is um, about which of these children you would find you think you would need to refer. Um, so just number two with this child with this, believe it or not, this is a hemangioma infancy, not a capillary malformation, not a port wine stain. Or do you think one and two with the eyes are involved uh, or one, two and three, this child with the lip as well or all of them? So if you can answer this one, um, so two only, one and two, one, two, and three, or all of them. We'll move on to the future, the quiz. Okay. So excellent, let's just go back to the photo. So most of you put, picked one, two, and three, and that is um, exactly right. So one, two, and three is, um, you know, they, these are the criteria for referring um, because they would need treatment. Um, so number one is a child with a hemangioma of infancy affecting the orbital rim, um, the uh, lid, and that uh, means that uh, they could potentially develop visual uh, uh, deficits, um, particularly um, uh, visual field uh, deficits, and um, with increased growth uh, can have uh, effects on the way the child um, is able to move their eyes, so definitely needs referral. When they come and see us, I would also get an opt-out review and then definitely um, start them on treatment. Uh, number two, uh, this is a, a segmental hemangioma of infancy. That means it involves a particular segment rather than a single lesion. And these can be linked and often linked with, a, um, with syndrome. Um, it's called FACES syndrome, uh, which involves uh, arterial abnormalities, brain anomalies, um, and uh, they are much more serious. Uh, these children might have neurological deficits, cardiac deficits, uh, brain abnormality, so they need uh, tertiary level care. They definitely need referral um, because of that segmental pattern, which might be in B1, B2, B3, or combination. Um, and then also you can have segmental involvement of the lumbar spine and uh, of the pelvis. So these children that have involvement in those areas definitely need further work up to tertiary level a dermatology referral, which would then involve in, uh, imaging studies and um, treatment. Number three is a child with a filtral uh, hemangioma of infancy. This is cosmesis and also feeding um, uh, issues. So this child would have cosme uh, cosmesis and feeding issues. So um, that filtral um, hemangioma of infancy will balloon up um, in the next few months and there will be a lot of excess baggy skin left where, even when it resolves. Uh, in a few years, so that can make a significant uh, disfigurement for the child, so definitely worth treating. 
On top of that, functionally feeding wise, there might be mucosal involvement under the lip and that uh, can result in difficulty um, uh, with uh, feeding uh, around the nipple or bottle. So that's definitely worth treating. This child is definitely worth treating. Um, finally, the fourth photo is a uh, gluteal hemangioma. Now this is, depends if you wanna treat or not. Um, and I would just have that discussion. Um, this area is high risk for ulceration. So that hemangioma has a high risk of ulceration just from being in the nappy area, that scrotal, uh, vulval, and um, perianal and um, gluteal hemangiomas. They're all at risk of ulceration due to um, irritancy um, in, under the nappy. So they may need uh, treatment, but um, often if they are well looked after and very well and don't suffer from dermatitis and don't have nappy rash, you could get away without treatment, just monitoring. Um, so it's not an absolute in terms of whether they need to be referred or not, but it's worthwhile having a chat to the parents talking about, um, talking about whether um, they would like to see somebody. So hemangioma complications, bleeding and ulceration, particularly high risk areas are the nappy area um, and flexural areas like the armpits, um, neck, et cetera. Um, and if they are predisposed to dermatitis, then you can get a bit of dermatitis overlying the hemangioma, which then can be broken with the scratching, which then predisposes to ulceration. Ulceration and bleeding in it of itself is not a bad thing, but that then can lead to secondary infection scarring. Um, so instead of skin uh, spontaneous resolution, which leaves new normal skin, they can actually end up with uh, scarring in that site, which we don't want. Um, deeper hemangiomas uh, can result in excess tissue st stretch or superficial hemangiomas affecting certain areas can result, uh, result in tissue st stretch which can result in extra fiber fatty tissue, this extra bag of uh, skin where the hemangioma has um, stretched the skin. Even after it goes, it's like a um, balloon that's been deflated and uh, that will need a plastic surgeon to remove this excess skin and, and there will be a scar. So that's a complication which can be avoided with treatment and um, particularly in uh, cosmetically sensitive areas like the face um, and um, hands, uh, feet, et cetera. Distortion of anatomy, um, we talked about the eye, the nose, filtral, uh, lip, um, and those things are uh, another reason for um, uh, treating. Functional issues, uh, vision, breathing, feeding, um, all of those things, so a neck hemangioma, for example, could be pressing internally with a deeper component. So those ones are worth uh, treating. Um, definitely the syndromic ones, which have a much more uh, complicated, these children have a much more complicated path, need a lot of different specialist input, need tertiary level care and imaging and treatment. And finally, um, multiple hemangiomas, which are five or more on the body, um, may signify deeper involvement um, of internal organs, liver, for example, which can result in cardiac failure due to high output uh, into these hemangiomas and also thyroid disease. So they also need, um, they can be um, something that um, you need to watch out for. Treatment these days, very straightforward. Propranolol, when I was training, we used to have these patients um, admitted uh, uh, for day stay. Um, lots of ECGs, echoes, um, cardiac, uh, T, uh, PEDS, PEDS cardiology review, um, then start the treatment with blood sugar, blood uh, heart rate, blood pressure, all this monitoring as an inpatient for the day. And then, um, you know, send them home with slow titration of treatment. Um, with patients, uh, you know, texting you or emailing you as a registrar going, um, when should I increase? How should I increase? And you were slowly, slowly increasing. That is not the case these days. We're very comfortable uh, giving propranolol for appropriate uh, patients in an outpatient setting at home with really good instructions. And, um, and this has been very well used and very well studied and very effective um, for the uh, patients that need it and uh, works very well. So um, a lot more uh, comfortable with giving this. And uh, now I think some pediatricians do that as well. So um, very good treatment um, and works very well. So uh, patients that end up having bleeding, ulceration, um, can end up having laser um, and that's for pain relief as well as and vascular laser for pain relief um, and for bleeding. Uh, and when they do get uh, eczema or bleeding, um, we addressing some wound management forms part of the picture as well. So 
Another uh, common skin condition I see, um, the commonest I see in the pediatric population is atopic dermatitis. Uh, the reason I um, wanted to talk about this today is because um, there is new treatment available for, um, for patients with atopic dermatitis, which has only been out the last few months um, in Australia. So I thought I'd quickly have a chat. So eczema is a condition that is atopic dermatitis is a genetically predisposed um, eczema. And uh, there is usually a problem with the barrier function. So think of the skin as a brick wall and they've got missing uh, cement between the bricks. And as a result, um, things can get into the skin and water can get out, um, lost and evaporate from the skin. So um, they're much more prone to irritants and allergens ir um, being sensitizing, uh, irritants um, getting into the skin and causing sensitive skin and allergens causing uh, allergic dermatitis. And then they're also prone to dry skin because of this constant evaporation of water through this leaky brick wall. Um, immune dysregulation plays a role. Um, and uh, we know that staph, uh, as an antigen uh, rather than a true um, infection can also um, perpetuate uh, dermatitis. So not just secondary, true secondary staph infection, but staph just sitting on the skin can also play a role in worsening atopic dermatitis, and which is um, forming a lot of our, um, newer topical emollient treatments. It's forming a lot of our... Um, a uh, new range of treatments. This is kind of guiding us um, in, with regards to anti-staph um, emollients um, that are going um, into, this, um, into moisturizers these days, anti-staph particles, which are helping uh, reduce the uh, level of staph sitting on our skin and bleach parts play a role with this. Uh, true secondary staph infection need to be treated. Um, and often, you know, when you are scratching your skin, you're uh, creating a portal of entry, that's why, a really good control of eczema means that your child won't, the child won't then need multiple um, causes of topical and oral antibiotics. I normally go through the ABC of management and, and uh, you know, emphasize the importance of all three steps in order to have really good, uh, healthy child with good quality of life, good sleep, good concentration, good behavior uh, once they become um, a child at school or childcare. Um, and, you know, really drum it into the parents, the importance of all three steps, not just one or two. So avoid irritants. Um, and it's a an e uh, complex interplay between environment and the skin and making sure that you pay attention to these irritants and reduce the potential for sensitization. All the natural things that are in food, um, in skin products these days are potential allergens, particularly in infancy where they haven't been introduced to these potential food allergens by mouth, by the gut and therefore are at higher risk of developing foods and um, food allergies if they're then transdermally exposed prior to having it exposed through the gut. So that's an important point. I drum, um, drum into the patients and then, um, you know, lots and lots of moisturising to build the um, barrier back up on the skin, like, um, you know, linking the uh, analogy of the cement into the brick wall, the moisturiser onto the skin um, to build back the brick wall and then uh, using corticosteroids, appropriate strength on the appropriate uh, site for the appropriate amount of time. So any of those um, are not addressed properly, then you're not gonna get on top of your eczema. Using a weak steroid on the wrong part of the body for not long enough, but then you're not gonna get it under control. So drum it into them that, you know, cumulatively, if you use it appropriately, you end up using less steroids longer term. So, um, you know, hit it until it completely goes away and a few days more so that there's microscopic activity under the skin that can be resolved so that this eczema doesn't keep um, yo-yoing back on the same spot and treat each new spot as a separate episode rather than going, I've been applying Advantan for the last six months. Well, you haven't been applying Advantan for the same area for the last six months and still seeing eczema. I can guarantee you that. So if you explain to them that each episode is an episode that occurs on, the, on a different part of the body and therefore you can restart your clock in terms of steroid application um, for up to two weeks in that particular spot, and then move on, new episode at a different part of the body, another two weeks for that spot and so on. And explain from day one, this is a chronic disorder. You're not gonna have a magic cure. It's not gonna um, go away forever. It's not curable, but we can manage it really well. And the earlier you start the treatment, the better um, the, better the chance of um, controlling the overall 
body surface area involvement. So waiting for the eczema to get worse and spread like wildfire all, all over the body means that you've got to play catch up. So if you can treat it at the first sign of redness and um, put the fire out, then you're not going to have embers flying everywhere and uh, sparking off, um, you know, eczema is a condition where uh, it auto eczematizes. What that means is if you have one part of the body at skin burning, then it's easy for another part to just go off and start um, creating another bit of a wildfire somewhere else. So staying on top of it is the key and getting the patient on um, parent on side in terms of steroid application is so crucial and using various analogies and encouraging them, encouraging the importance of, um, of using these creams and exploring the steroid phobia and uh, uh, mis distrust in patients and this over, uh, you know, over um, enthusiastic concern um, of steroid uh, um, side effects and explaining how this is all very historical. It used to be due to um, fluorinated um, steroids that are no longer really available and therefore, you know, it's not such a concern and um, highlighting the detriment um, of not treating eczema to the point of pointing out, um, you know, how much this child is likely to suffer, sleep, behaviour, um, all of that um, really puts the things um, into perspective. But these patients I normally spend half an hour with in the first consult and bring back. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk today about atopic dermatitis is particularly because we now have dupilumab or dupixent, which is a biologic, um, which is an interleukin-4 and 13 um, blockade, uh, which is now approved for moderate to severe eczema um, for children over 12. This is a biologic injection, which costs the government 20 to uh, $40,000 a year, depending on the dosage that we choose. Um, and um, that's per year, per patient, indefinitely. Um, and it is approved via PBS and it's, very, very effective in certain cases of eczema. So we have to qualify the patient um, who does not respond to topical steroids. So a patient that has used moderate to uh, potent uh, steroids um, for, the, for the past 28 days prior to application and has not seen the significant improvement that we would like. Um, you don't have to have them on systemic. So prior to biologics, we used to have the patients on traditional immune suppressions like methotrexate, cyclosporin, um, azathioprine, all sorts of things which, you know, um, raise hairs on um, parents' arms when you say it's an immune suppression and needs blood monitoring, can affect the liver, kidneys, etc. So these, this is revolutionising in a way. If um, You have to pick the right patient um, and it doesn't work for all severe eczema, um, but if you can get the right patient, it is life-changing um, in that it is not an immune suppressant. It works the way that biologics works is that they're specific to that condition. So they're not a global blanket immune suppressant that like methotrexate, which we use for psoriasis, eczema, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, you name it. Um, but so when they are so specific to eczema or the skin condition being treated, you know that they don't tend to have this wide array of side effects. They are specific to that particular immune pathway that led to this condition. So they're a lot more specific and effective um, and tend to be better uh, side effect profile. So um, commonly you see injection site reactions as the main issue and the injections are usually every uh, fortnight and patients, we teach our patients to uh, give this injection or the parent to give the injection in the case of a teenager. Um, and uh, that's the main side effect about 5% or so of ice-related side effect, conjunctivitis, blepharitis, keratitis, and usually mild and improves with most cases with um, lubricating eye drops, sometimes requiring steroid eye drops and sometimes ophthalmology review. Um, also uh, can um, result in herpes infection reactivation and upper respiratory tract infection, but these are less common. And it is amazing for severe eczema in over 12 year olds who can um, have access to this medication. So final two, hair conditions. Uh, I thought I'll quickly go through some common uh, hair conditions that I see, alopecia areata, I uh, see commonly in, um, in children, um, autoimmune disorder, um, and it's usually um, in childhood um, and 
it's often associated with other autoimmune um, pathogenesis, uh, uh, autoimmune pathology, uh, such as thyroid disease, um, and uh, or in the family or the individual. Uh, it's often unpredictable, and it can just uh, stay as one or two patches or can quickly progress to involve to, uh, all of the scalp, totalis, or universalis, other parts of the body, um, including our arms, legs, eyebrows, eyelashes, etc. cetera. Uh, it can be extremely psychologically debilitating for a young person to develop this or an adult uh, to develop this. Um, and there are various treatments that we have available um, that work quite effectively. Um, so I might quickly do another quiz. Um, which of these is a positive uh, prognostic factor um, in alopecia areata? If you can pick your answer. Okay. Excellent. So, um, in fact, um, as I said, childhood onset is commonest, but adult onset is um, actually a positive prognostic factor. So, having it as an adult is better than having it as a child. Uh, family history is a negative prognostic factor, as are uh, long standing patches, as, as well as male involvement. So, um, earlier that they're referred for treatment, the better the chances of her getting hair back. Um, other prognostic, negative prognostic factors are multiple patches of involvement, um, previous uh, history, family history, um, systemic involvement, um, uh, other uh, autoimmune uh, pathogenesis. All of these are um, unfortunately negative prognostic factors in terms of their chances of regrowing the hair. Um, so we like to do a lot of intralesional corticosteroids at the practice. Uh, it works very well. Um, at the children's hospital, we do this under nitrous um, for our children um, with a lot of distraction and, um, you know, as young as five to six and works very well in them as well. Fortunately, topicals just don't work. The pathogen, well, don't work very well. Uh, the pathogenesis for alopecia areata is at the bulbar level, which is, you know, in the scalp is in that. Um, fat. Um, most creams don't penetrate deep enough to achieve immune, um, immune cell mediation at that uh, depth. And therefore, you know, it's just simple science that that's not going to be effective. Whereas intralesional goes to where it needs to go at, to that depth and you get really good, um, really good response, particularly in patches that are addressed as soon as it starts falling. If you wait six months uh, to treat a bald patch, you may not get the hair back because the you know, immune cells have just gone and had a field day at the bulb. But if you address it within the first few weeks to months of their hair falling out in that single patch and inject it, they get really good response. The hair grows back, you know, um, with Bella's hair, these fine white hairs, and that's because the pigment within the bulb has also been affected. Um, so it's not uncommon to get white hairs growing back. So the melanocytes have been damaged as well as the hair bulb. And then eventually the melanocytes grow back, the hair grows back to brown color. And you can see in this gentleman, even though on face, like really quick view, you might just say, hair's only growing back at the center of the lesion. Looking closely, you can see lots of white hairs, pretty much white, um, in, within every follicle, there's hair, hairs, some of them white on the periphery, that means those will um, those have all shown growth. He doesn't need further injections. So when you see him like this, you wouldn't um, in this kid you wouldn't re-inject him. And usually the injections are every um, every few um, every four to six weeks. Um, other treatment options we can do um, DCP, um, which is an immune therapy. Uh, the theory is that you give the uh, T lymphocytes, the immune cells, a distraction um, from attacking the bulb. So create a bit of an eczema on the surface of the skin, the epidermis, and get them away from the hair bulb and let the hair grow. Um, so it's an 
uh, it's an um, irritant that you're creating a bit of a um, eczema with uh, wherever you're applying it. So on the ball patches, and then you're uh, allowing the hair um, to grow. So you're distracting the, uh, the immune cells um, and it works quite well as well. Um, it might all, not always be very well tolerated in very young children, but adults seem to tolerate it okay. Um, there are some side effects, um, particularly locally, um, like alopecia, uh, like vitiligo and significant eczema, but uh, you can usually um, moderate, um, manage this uh, quite well. Um, there's also options in uh, children that have very significant involvement, like in this young uh, teenager, uh, of uh, or, um, of immune suppressants such as methotrexate. If it's quickly falling, I would normally give them a course of oral prednisone um, for six to eight weeks. And then um, as that uh, is being weaned, I would uh, have titrated up uh, an immune suppression like methotrexate, uh, which would have taken six to eight weeks to kick in anyway. So you're kind of weaning um, this rapidly acting steroid whilst um, you're, you're uh, getting a longer stable immune suppression that's less side effect prone to kick in. Um, so that's a good way to manage more um, severe disease and more uh, quickly progressing disease. Jack inhibitors, um, I've used that uh, in a hospital setting um, uh, with a rheumatologist um, so that we can get access to Jack inhibitors. Um, they, they're not very easily accessible. We have to go through the hospital committee to get that and it has really good evidence. Another common hair loss disorder I see is androgenetic alopecia. Um, there's a few different patterns, male versus female pattern. Um, female pattern, not really related to androgens. The hormones tend to be normal, even in male. So I tend not to do a, a hormonal panel unless there are features that I'm particularly concerned about. Um, it has a very strong genetic uh, predisposition. It doesn't have to be um, on the female side, if it's a female presenting with female pattern, it could be even the male side. So it could be their father or grandfather in a male, female patient presenting with female pattern hair loss and vice versa. Um, it could be grandfather, mum, dad, et cetera. Um, it is an uh, ongoing progressive hair loss. So it doesn't stop. Um, and that's the norm. And treatment, therefore, is indefinite. You're aiming to uh, keep whatever hairs they have from the time of starting treatment rather than regrow what's gone. And so treatment expectations and discussing that is crucial um, because a lot of patients come to you quite late. If you can refer them early, then you're giving them the chance of keeping whatever hair they have rather than getting to a stage three or beyond where they've got lots of um, visible scalp showing. It's a condition in females where they get uh, central parting um, and uh, there's a Christmas tree pattern with this widening of the central part. Uh, and in males, it's that classic um, bitemporal uh, recession with the occipital uh, involvement. And the treatments uh, typically uh, start with minoxidil um, in a lotion base. Don't go for anything less than 5%, even though that's a, high, a slightly higher risk for irritation on the skin. These patients, 2% um, generally, doesn't work. So 5%, um, um, you can just get over the counter. And then um, if they need to escalate um, oral minoxidil, um, oral spironolactone, supraturin acetate, all of these are um, good options or um, finasteride if, um, if it's a male patient. So I might do the final question. Um, we're moving on to the nail disorders now. Which of these is a malignant um, melanoma? So have a look at the picture here. There's this pigmented area, this pigmented band, this um, pigment, um, light pigment band, and then here, this area here. bit more divided. Okay. Let's just stop it there and go back to our previous photo. So in fact, 
the answer is B, um, this, this one here. I think most of you picked B, um, which is good. Uh, and I'll go through what, what that is. So the first one is a nail hemorrhage, so, um, subungal hematoma, uh, usually uh, preceded with a history of trauma, but might not be. Most patients who might not remember, um, but they might have changed shoes, gone on a hike, etc. Uh, it's important to recognize this could be months preceding them noticing this um, injury. Um, it could be months prior to uh, noticing the change. Toenails grow very slowly. What you would do is have a look under the dermatoscope. You see these lacuna of blood, uh, blood um, hemorrhage um, with these uh, little drops, and that's classic for um, hemorrhage. And if you wanted to, you can review them in uh, three months as the nail grows out. It's reassuring to see that it grows out. Toenails grow slowly, so uh, keep that in mind that it's not going to change in a month or so. Um, so nail melanoma, um, the features are, um, you know, quite a wide um, melanechia and uh, with this variable stripe. So if you think of uh, a pigmented lesion that's suspicious on skin, you apply the same ABCD essentially uh, to, the tone, uh, to the nail. Uh, this is very asymmetry, variable um, pigmentation throughout the lesion. So, you know, some areas are light, some are dark, variable um, sizes of bands, quite large lesions. So I guess that's to do with the size of greater than six millimeters, or, but in this case, it's uh, usually occupying greater than a third of the nail um, and uh, also associated with dystrophy of the nail. So uh, breakage in the nail plate um, can also uh, help uh, with um, identifying this. If you have a look at the other photos, this is um, in an individual of skin type three and she had came to me just um, worried about this. If you look at her other nails, she had two other nails involved as well. I think one on her finger and uh, this is on her finger, one on her toenail. Um, so uh, it's it's not common, to, uh, uncommon to have multiple nail involvement in uh, racial pigmentation um, and uh, also in, um, in individuals uh, who have drug induced pigmentation. Um, this is another one uh, to do with trauma. So you can see that they've got underlying um, uh, traumatic uh, nail plate change. Uh, these vertical um, horizontal uh, uh, bow lines, uh, interruption of the nail plate growth, um, and that's classic for um, trauma. And then they've got uh, hemorrhage underneath. So with the dermatoscope, you can see you would be able to appreciate similar changes to what you see in the uh, under the dermatoscope with this lesion. Okay, so we're just finishing. Um, sorry, I talked a lot. Uh, is there any, are there any questions? Sorry, Jamie, just get my microphone on. Um, there are lots of questions. Um, so you've got lots of people questioning. I think the first one um, that really got people going was about the wart treatment. I think most of us aren't all that familiar with the carathardin. And I'm wondering, how do we get that? What strength do we use? And are there any issues, for example, using that around um, in the genital region or perianal region at all? Yeah, so cantharidin is a compounded treatment. So it's not available pre-made. You've got to get a chemist to make it for you. Until this uh, start of this year, uh, you could get your friendly compounding chemist to make it for you, and uh, he would send a, a, a practice uh, supply of cantharidin uh, rather than individual patient supply. And you know, you, off you go, you put it on everyone that comes on, uh, comes along with wart, and you know, you look like you're doing a fantastic job. Unfortunately, compounding chemists stop stop supplying this generic practice use of cantharidin as they did with so many other treatments like TCA and uh, aluminum chloride, which we dermatologists kind of rely on as our bread and butter. And now we, I have, I'm an authorized prescriber. So you have to go through TGA to prescribe this product, which is, so the therapeutic goods um, and administration, they, they, uh, they recognize this product as something that's not uh, currently 
um, uh, well evidenced um, for use. Therefore, you must then supply the evidence uh, and the indication why you want to use it, get approval, become an authorised prescriber, which is a lot of paperwork, which I do through the hospital committee, ethics committee, um, which is a fantastic reason to work in the public hospital. And then uh, you uh, can then individually, per patient, uh, apply uh, for this treatment to be used. So this is a, a lot of painful paperwork, um, which has only changed recently. So I had no problems the last few years getting this medication and suddenly things have changed upside down. So maybe you can find a um, compounding chemist that will look the other way to do this. But uh, I think a lot of them are now cracking down and saying um, you need to provide the script per patient. Uh, they need You need to be an authorised prescriber. So it's a bit of an effort um, and uh, it works really, really well. So simple cantharidin is 0.7% yep. E and you know, most compounding chemists will make it up for you and it causes a little blister. Cantharidin plus uh, is uh, 1% with sal acid, 30% sal acid. Yep. And you can sometimes add a bit of pedophilin as well. So these are clinic applied. You can't give it to the patient and say, off you go. Um, you need to um, follow them up. You need to give them post um, cantharidin care because they'll develop a blister. You put it on, you cover it up. You ask them to take the tape off in um, four to six hours depending on the site that you're using it in. And then you ask them to wash it with soap and water. Um, they will develop a blister at that area yeah, within the 24 hours. You give them a sterile needle to pop that blister, decompress the blister, leave the roof of the blister intact as a natural dressing, and then just lots of Vaseline for the next five days. Eventually that skin peels off and the warts lifted off. And so it works amazingly well. Mm. Works really well for um, uh, genital molluscum in patients that adult patients that don't want molluscum there, uh, which is usually sexually transmitted and uh, can be a big um, thing for a young uh, man or woman. And uh, they tolerate it well. We do a few uh, lesions each time, 10 to 15 each time. Within um, two, three treatments, all of it's gone. Um, and um, it works also for genital warts. You have to be careful. Um, it is not strictly, um, you know, um, in the, if you read the fine lines in most studies, they say avoid in mucosal surface, but uh, we use it uh, with very uh, caution and it works very well um, mucosally as well um, if you're happy to use it. Fantastic. Thanks for that. It was a lot of interest in that one particularly. Um, yeah. we're, running, we're running out of time, but I just want to quickly ask you about the fluconazole. Um, that's mm -hmm. not, is, can we get that on the PBS or if we're using that? No. So that is that a, a barrier to using that? No, it's not too expensive. It's very affordable. Fluoric acid, on the other hand, is uh, can be cost prohibitive. Um, so that can be an issue for the resistant strain. So it can be up to $90 a month for the boric acid. Uh, or even, uh, I mean, compounding chemists means it's a, they can ask whatever they want. So I ask them to shop around. We have a few chemists that we normally point our patients towards, but um, but fluconazole is not cost prohibitive. Most patients are very, um, very, very happy to purchase that. There's no, um, yeah, PBS indication for it, for this particular thing, but um, very cheap these days. Um, so take that initially daily, and then once they go on the maintenance dose, it lasts them forever. A 28. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we've got a question uh, from, about spironolactone use in acne uh, yeah. and also about um, once the acne is improved, um, what happens once you stop and that flares again three to six months later? Yeah. So spironolactone is used for hormonal acne um, generally and works very well. Um, I tend to use it in a teenager with hormonal acne. When I see hormonal acne in an adult, I go, well, how long do you want to keep treating your hormonal acne for? Do you want to treat it for the next decade with a, a hormonal treatment like spironolactone or the oral contraceptive pill, or do you want to treat it for a year, get rid of it, then have all fertility choices available to you um, whenever you want? Um, so it is a good treatment in teenagers and also in um, women that don't want to go on Rakutane, but um, it's essentially indefinite. It will come back um, if they're predisposed to it. So it's a bit of, uh, you know, how long is the piece of string and what does the patient want? So uh, you really have to lay it out to them. The only treatment in the acne 
space that offers cure is isotretinoin, so Rakutane. So why are we treating an adult with acne indefinitely with all these other treatments when we could potentially get cure for them with isotretinoin? And when you explain it like that, most patients turn around and say, yes, oh, yes. I'll have that. Fair enough. Um, just again, running out of time, really quickly, there's a couple of questions about um, eczema, um, one around the bleach baths, and are we still doing that? And at what age uh, can we do that? Um, and um, do you have any particular resources that we can use for um, parents who do have uh, a steroid phobia? Um, look, I think resources um, wise, it's, it's more about uh, the trust that they have with you and the time investment that you have. I don't think pointing them to a resource will reassure any parent that has come in made up, making up their mind. But sitting down, spending the time and explaining it in those terms where you say, look, these are historical fears. This is from a historical data. Um, you know, the, the way we use steroids is different. And then I kind of spook them a bit into uh, you know, realizing the long-term effect of what they're doing to their child if they don't treat the eczema well, the effects on their sleep, the effects on their psyche, the effects on their behavior. When these children um, from infancy to childhood, uh, to childcare, to, um, to school age, um, get to the point of being really poorly behaved just because they haven't slept, they're scratching themselves, they can't concentrate at school, falling behind at school, mm. all of these things, they just go, oh, my God, what am I doing to my child? So I think it's more about sitting with them, talking to them, rather than really resources because they will come with their own resources, things that yes. they've printed out and they, sure. they will show you documentation mm. So I don't think that's my approach. Um, what was the other part of the question? I just did about um, bleach baths. Bleach baths. And yeah. Yes. So, yes. yeah, so bleach baths form a, um, in my um, regimen, it formed a part in ch children that get recurrent in secondary infected eczema. So severe eczema that tends to colonize with uh, derm uh, staph or, yep. um, or in um, patients that end up in hospital with acute eczema that's oozy, wet, golden crust, et cetera. Bleach parts form a way of reducing the staph uh, carriage on the skin, the staph load on the skin, because inevitably the child's going to get um, a staph uh, going into the skin because they're not treating the eczema well. But essentially, I want them off bleach parts because they're going to take really good care of their skin. They're not going to have bad eczema. So, you know, that's not a forever treatment. It's just a for now treatment. Mm -hmm. 